Okay, so imagine this. Imagine the entire universe. Something that stretches nearly 50 billion years in every direction, from right here in the center. And the thing is, from every single direction, we actually also see this very bizarre light, only visible in the microwave frequencies, that today is referred to as CMB or the Cosmic Microwave Background. And well, the thing is, if you were to combine the energy of all of this light from the entire universe and then compare this to the light from various stars, various galaxies, galactic clusters and so on, in terms of the energy output, it turns out the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, actually exceeds the total energy of all light ever emitted by every single star that has existed through cosmic history. So this cosmic microwave background contains so much more energy than every single star combined in the entire universe. And that is an incredible amount of energy, which kind of makes sense when you think about where this came from. This is the echo of the Big Bang. Or technically this is the ultimate picture of the infant universe, that shows us literally the earliest electromagnetic radiation coming from every direction in the universe, but also represents a kind of a wall. A wall beyond which we can never really see using electromagnetic radiation. Which is why it's usually called the earliest light. And so today we're actually going to explore some of the recent discoveries about this very interesting concept, discuss this relic radiation in a little bit more detail, but more importantly, talk about at least a couple of theoretical studies where scientists are now trying to figure out how to see beyond this wall, which might actually be possible using slightly different methods. And so let's talk about all of these studies that, as always, you can find in the description below. But I guess let's start with, okay, so what exactly is this and how was this produced? And in a nutshell, the CMB, or the Cosmic Microwave Background, is literally just an afterglow from when the universe started to cool down. And this is, of course, one of the most, if not the most, important pieces of evidence supporting the Big Bang Theory. As a matter of fact, its existence was predicted before its discovery, and so once it was accidentally discovered by the American scientists by using some of the earlier radio telescopes, it literally served as the main foundation for the Big Bang. But to understand why it exists, we do have to travel back in time. And by the way, fun fact, this is the Holmdel Horn antenna that was used by Penzias and Wilson to discover the cosmic microwave background. And so, in the early universe, for the first 300,000 years, the universe was incredibly hot and super dense. In some sense, it was even more extreme than what happens inside the sun right now, which would represent a very hot plasma. And so it was not a vacuum with stars and galaxies, it was basically this opaque fog of hot plasma mostly consisting of subatomic particles like protons and electrons that were actually not connected, mostly because it was just too hot. And in this environment, the light, or electromagnetic energy, simply could not travel freely. Every single photon scattered off the free electrons almost immediately, basically getting stuck inside indefinitely. And this essentially made cosmos more or less opaque or impossible to see through. Sometimes this is referred to as the primordial light barrier. But then approximately 370 to 380,000 years following the Big Bang, the universe expanded just enough and cooled just enough to about 3000 Kelvin that it finally allowed some of the protons and electrons to start combining. And so at this temperature, the electrons and protons finally formed some of the first atoms. In this case, neutral atoms of hydrogen. And in cosmology, this is known as recombination period, which you can sort of learn about in one of the links in the description. And so once these atoms formed, and once all of these electrons became bound to protons, this is when the universe actually became more or less transparent. It finally allowed the light to travel through. And so all of the previously trapped photons were now released, with the event now referred to as decoupling. And then, as the universe continued to expand for over 13 billion years, all of that initial light that now escaped eventually became ridiculously redshifted, being stretched to extremely long wavelengths. And so even though the initial temperature was 3000 Kelvin, all of this cooled down to about 2.7 Kelvin, with all of this light now redshifted into the microwave wavelengths. Which is what's visible here. This essentially shows us this microwave background that was initially produced by a ridiculously hot universe. And some of the first observations of the CMB reveal that it was incredibly smooth. It appeared almost completely uniform everywhere. This was also a very important discovery because it essentially confirmed that the universe seems to be pretty much the same, or it seems to be isotropic, in every single direction. No matter where you go, no matter when you go, the universe is the same. 
or at least that's what it looked like at first. But then with slightly more sensitive telescopes such as WMAP and Planck, these new instruments revealed tiny tiny temperature variations known as anisotropies, which though minuscule were still visible. Here the difference was approximately one part in 25,000. So essentially this was just a tiny tiny fraction of a degree. But these tiny ripples were incredibly important. These actually showed us the seeds of structure formation. Or just to rephrase this, they were caused by various denser regions in the universe, usually galactic clusters, that were created as the gravity pulled a lot of gas inward and eventually produced what's known as the cosmic web, or this enormous structure containing dark matter and a lot of gas and stars, that basically forms a scaffolding for many different galaxies and galactic clusters. And this eventually resulted in a completely new field of cosmology. Trying to study patterns inside this cosmic microwave background and trying to understand what must have happened a long time ago and what produced some of these ripples. But importantly, this confirmed a lot of initial ideas and initial propositions about the Big Bang and the overall size and shape of the universe. Here, without these explanations, it was very difficult to explain exactly what we're observing. This was also the foundation for the so-called standard model of cosmology, also known as Lambda CDM. The model that states that the universe mostly contains dark energy, approximately 26% of dark matter, and about 5% is regular stuff. So here we're talking about stars and galaxies, and of course things we are made out of. But all of these discoveries were made by space telescopes, very expensive missions that are unlikely to happen again anytime soon. And technically now we're entering a completely new era of ground-based microwave studies. And especially because of telescopes like this, at a Kama Cosmology Telescope, also known as ACT. And this can now produce extremely high resolution mapping of everything around us, forming some of the most detailed pictures of the CMB. In this case it has at least five times the resolution of the Planck telescope and much greater sensitivity. And so simultaneously with the South Pole Telescope, not so long ago it released a lot of new data, providing exceptionally sensitive measurements that have never been possible before. And here it doesn't just map the temperature, it also provides high resolution images of the polarization of light, which actually reveals motion of hydrogen and helium across different time scales. And so in some sense, in the future, when all of this data is going to be collected and analyzed, researchers might even be able to create an actual moving picture, or a movie, showing a subtle motion of gas in the early universe, which can then help us infer how strong the pull of gravity was in various regions. And so once again we're entering a completely new era for cosmology. And furthermore, by combining this data with the data from DESI, or the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, researchers can now even investigate something entirely different all sorts of shadows in the universe. And specifically by using the map from the CMB as a backlight, they can then start looking for shadows cast by mass in various galaxies, which in time will allow researchers to create entirely different maps, in some sense even showing us the architecture of the universe itself. Here we'll be able to see how the mass is distributed, how it changes over time, and where everything seems to flow. But even these initial studies have already confirmed that a lot of galactic gas density seems to be definitely organized in these very large web-like filaments. This is what we refer to as the cosmic web. And all of this gas is definitely moving in a very certain direction, as if it's basically following the river. I think this video right here kind of presents this the best. And so even though this was theoretical and based on a lot of different propositions from years ago, we now have actual evidence that this is what the universe really looks like. And so quite a lot of super exciting discoveries already, even though this telescope just started operating. But that's of course just the CMB. Now the point of this video was to actually try to see if we can see beyond it. And so despite these amazing discoveries, at the moment the CMB still remains as a kind of a impenetrable wall. We cannot use light to directly observe anything beyond it, and so the first 380,000 years remain a mystery. And because so many critical things happen during this time, researchers really want to find a way to see beyond this, even down to the first moments of the Big Bang. And while well, it turns out that there might be some ways, very clever and tricky ways, to indirectly gather information from beyond this light, primarily by looking for particles other than photons that could have escaped earlier. And so what exactly are those methods and what's being proposed? Now as always you can learn more about this in the two papers in the description below. But in essence there are two main methods. First one is by using the neutrino advantage. And that's because we know that neutrinos can easily go through matter. 
And so here scientists hypothesize that various explosive events, such as for example various bursts that might have occurred in the early universe, for example various collapses of mass into something like a black hole, could have produced a lot of neutrinos. And because neutrinos interact only with the weak force, they are the most likely particles to escape this region and thus travel even in the super dense environment in the first 380,000 years. And so by looking at the cosmic neutrino background, scientists might be able to detect neutrinos coming from various ancient events. But that's of course just in theory, because in practice this seems to be super challenging. Mostly because, unfortunately, observing these cosmic neutrinos is just beyond current technology. Right now we can detect some neutrinos coming from certain regions in the much older universe, but once again because they don't really like to interact with matter, even detecting neutrinos coming from the nearby black hole, for example, is usually just a matter of chance. And so until we have more sensitive and much better neutrino detectors, at least for now this is going to remain just a hypothesis. Right now none of the neutrino detectors we have are capable of finding these. But that is one of the future goals for our cosmology and will definitely provide so many answers for so many questions if one day we can find these cosmic neutrinos from the ancient universe. You can actually find out more about this concept of the cosmic neutrino background in one of the previous videos in the description. But then there's also a second method that in some sense may work. Here we're talking about soft x-rays from positron annihilation. Now this is still just a theoretical proposition, but it's assumed that during these first 300,000 years, some of these neutrinos as they were produced may also be able to interact with various protons. And when the neutrino interacts with a proton, it also creates a positron basically an antimatter of an electron. But if a positron is produced, since there are electrons literally everywhere, they would quickly get destroyed by combining with electrons and would actually produce an extremely specific photon of 511 kiloelectron volts. This is referred to as annihilation radiation and we actually do detect this everywhere in the universe, especially coming from the center of the galaxy that we've actually discussed not so long ago. And so we know quite a lot about these emissions based on a lot of different studies. And so if one day we actually detect something like this coming from the ancient universe, in this case though this would be highly redshifted, and if we can confirm the existence of these early positrons, it would actually confirm something important about the early universe and would confirm the existence of these very dramatic explosive bursts that very likely annihilated electrons and positrons. But as these photons propagate for billions of years and as they become redshifted, today they would be arriving to us with the energy of about 2 to maybe 3 kiloelectron volts. Technically this would be a soft x-ray. And so the main point of one of these recent papers is to essentially urge scientists to try to find these signals with very specific wavelengths, which would appear as a very unique, very broad bump in the soft x-ray spectrum, distinguishing it from a much more smooth local cosmic background. In other words, scientists behind the study proposed the existence of these soft x-rays, which might actually represent the earliest true light coming from these very early explosions in the first 300,000 years. With the alternative third method, also suggesting that if these bursts were real and if there were a lot of early explosions creating these very powerful events, the massive amounts of energy produced during such explosions would very likely be absorbed by some of this early plasma that would then be deposited into much smaller regions and would actually appear as very bizarre hotspots inside the cosmic microwave background itself. But they would appear as extremely small deviations and right now we just don't have the resolution yet to see them in the current maps. But these future maps created by the telescopes that just started operating might be able to see them. And so there's a very high chance we might be making even more discoveries about the CMB and about the early universe in the next few years. And so this faint echo of the Big Bang that transformed from a single temperature measurement to an extremely precise map we use today and that essentially validated cosmological models we have is still full of so many different mysteries that will help us understand the universe even more. And while the CMB technically represents the visual boundary for the universe, as these studies suggest, there might be a way to see through it after all. We don't really have the technology yet, but we're definitely getting there one experiment at a time. And so either through these mysterious particles like neutrinos or these subtle disturbances in the x-ray background, we might finally be able to peer beyond the wall of light and into the true beginning of the universe. And once we do, we'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. 
Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.